From Madison, Wisconsin, and broadcast online across the globe, welcome to America's Wild Report, your source of news and updates from the 2011 National Wildlife Refuge Systems Conserving the Future Conference. Featuring Correspondent Michael Woodbridge from Region 8, Correspondent Kim Benton from Region 9, and your host, Region 4's Jennifer Strickland. And now, your host of America's Wild Report, Jennifer Strickland. Thank you, Jason, and welcome again to America's Wild Report. I'm Jennifer Strickland from the Conserving the Future Conference in Madison, Wisconsin. The first general session of the 2011 Conserving the Future Conference kicked off Tuesday morning. After a presentation of the colors by the Honor Guard and a rousing rendition of our national anthem, Tom Melius, Midwest Regional Director, kicked off the event with a cultural lesson about the Midwest. They know in the Midwest region there's three or four things that stand out. First, it's fashion. <laughs> Where else can you wear a camouflage to formal events? And it's very appropriate. Cuisine. We always have the four food groups at every meal. Venison, fish, brats, and cheese. <laughs> and where, if you go to a potluck and you bring a, a fruit jello, you get credit for three dishes. <laughs> you got a salad, you got a side dish, and you got dessert. But really, folks, it's because in the Midwest region, we have 54 great wildlife refuges, 12 wetland management districts, over 40 friends groups, an active fisheries program, ecological services, migratory birds, and over 1,200 of the most dedicated people in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's an honor to be their regional director and the host region of this conference. Refuge Chief Greg Sakanik charged the crowd with his vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System. So as we begin our deliberations, I ask you to think of how. How will you help to implement this vision? Are the things that you are working on day in and day out really helping make this vision come to life? Are you asking yourself whether your work is relevant to the changes we face, to the challenges we face? What could be more important to your legacy, to your individual legacy, than ensuring a long-term conservation viability of the place that you have come to love? Are you working to project conservation benefits beyond the boundaries? Are you engaging our state wildlife counterparts? Is your work meeting those challenges we face? Are you the manager, supervisor, or the executive who is always too busy to mentor a young person? If you don't make development of future leaders, including yourself, a top priority, are you moving the conservation vision forward? Are you stepping to those challenges? So I ask every one of you, Challenge yourself and help us realize a vision for conserving the future. This is our time. We will carry the work forward. I want you to be excited. I hope you are. Bring your enthusiasm. Conserving the future, wildlife refuges of the next generation, it's in our hands. So I want to close with the words of another famous conservationist from Wisconsin. Many of you probably know Sigrid Olson. He told us, Respect the land. It has intrinsic value that our spirits need. Don't be afraid to fight for it. It is worth the struggle. Let's make this week everything it has the potential to be, and let's have some fun along the way. I am so honored to be amongst all of you. Thank you. Buddy Huffaker from the Aldo Leopold Foundation tied together the historical implications of Aldo Leopold on our land ethic. We affectionately refer to this part of the world as Leopold Country. But Leopold Country is as much a state of mind as it is a geographic place. It is a state of mind that is embodied in the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where all things natural, wild, and free are recognized, respected, and valued. Aldo Leopold was, in fact, asked to serve as the agency's first director. 
But he ultimately decided that he could have a bigger impact from outside by working with his friend and colleague, Ding Darling, who ultimately took the position. This gathering is a reflection of this continued public-private partnership that shapes, protects, and advances the National Wildlife Refuge System, providing both science and advocacy. Yes, advocacy, not in the strict sense of, of lobbying as we see it going on so frequently today, but rather in the sense that ensures the voice that is necessary for the continuation of spaces and places critical to the human endeavor. Places that provide all of the economic, ecological, and emotional returns that are possible where and when land is healthy. And after closing out the morning with a presentation on ocean conservation, famed oceanographer Dr. Sylvia Earle sat down with correspondent Michael Woodbridge to talk about her inspirations. I'm Michael Woodbridge coming to you from the Conserving the Future conference in Madison, Wisconsin, where I had the chance to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Sylvia Earle, noted oceanographer. Well, here in Madison, Wisconsin, we're far from the nearest ocean, relatively speaking. There was an ocean here, though, once upon a time. Right. <laughs> yeah, Long right ago. Down the street uh, is the home uh, to another conservationist, Aldo Leopold. Yes. Uh, who communicated a land ethic. My hero. And your speech today talked a lot about a, a land ethic as it applies to oceans. An ocean ethic, really, is what it is. Right. Um, what did you learn from Aldo Leopold, and uh, how are you, or how are your and Leopold's land ethics similar? I think Aldo Leopold was was among the first to appreciate not just species conservation but ecosystem conservation. And and now with astronauts up in the sky looking back, you know, it isn't land here, ocean there, sky up here. It's 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 all one system. So we really need a what, a nature ethic, uh, an ethic of life? It isn't land, it isn't ocean, it isn't fresh water, it's, it's everything, it isn't, it's just an earth ethic, taking care of the natural systems that take care of us. He really was a right voice at the right time to articulate a voice for nature and People listened, fortunately. But we need a voice now to look even more at how much of the natural systems have been lost. Thinking that it was okay because nature is resilient. We're just little puny humans. We can't possibly alter the way the world works. At the conference, several references have been made to how nature the natural systems, the, the, the refuges, the parks, whatever they are, they're not luxuries. They're not places that we can put a fence around and say, well, now we've done our bit for, for the natural world. No, the, now we know that this is our life support system that we're protecting. This is our, not just everything that has brought us to where we are now, it is fundamental that we take care of the natural world if we are to have a future. Renowned author Dr. Douglas Brinkley finished the morning by celebrating the legacy of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Correspondent Kim Benton got a moment to sit down with Dr. Brinkley. Kim? It was a full house Tuesday in the lecture hall of the Monona Terrace. Attendees of the Conserving the Future conference turned out for a keynote address by renowned author and Rice University professor Doug Brinkley. During an interview with AmericasWildlife.org, Brinkley expressed the mission behind the conference is essential and reaching out to youth is the move in the right direction for the future of the National Wildlife Refuge System. The main thing for, I think, with young people is by the 1960s, you know, the word conservation got somewhat phased out in favor of environmentalism. If you go to any school today, you'll see kids celebrating Earth Day. If you look at what Michelle Obama's doing about planting a garden. Brinkley, who is also a Theodore Roosevelt biographer and fellow in history at the James Baker Institute of Public Policy, spoke of the unique significance of America's great outdoors, including urban communities. 
And we have a lot of our national wildlife refuges that are right around urban areas. But how do we get people to learn to use them for recreation, to access them, or find solitude or them, or just be proud to be a friend of that refuge uh, for the sake of keeping some um, natural spaces around uh, industrial sprawl. And so there's a, a, I think it's an urgent need to start pushing to have outdoor studies back into the schools. The conference was a great opportunity for attendees to support the federal duck stamp and junior duck stamp programs. Rachel Levin from the Migratory Bird Office describes a special edition developed just for this event. This is Bob Danley reporting from the Vision Conference. Earlier today I encountered Rachel Levin from the Migratory Bird Office in Arlington, Virginia. And Rachel is here selling a special commemorative cachet of the federal junior duck stamp and the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp. Each stamp has a different purpose. The Junior Duck Stamp is representative of 28,000 art entries from K through 12 students. And the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp is the result of a national competition between professional artists. Well, the Federal Duck Stamp Program and the National Wildlife Refuge System are really inextricably linked. 98% uh, of the proceeds from the sales of federal duck stamps go directly back towards acquiring wetlands habitat for the National Wildlife Refuge System. The Federal Junior Duck Stamp Program is really all about engaging our kids today, getting them connected with the outdoors, and really instilling in them a love for their natural world. And they really are our future conservation stewards. So the Junior Duck Stamp Program is terrifically important to get kids engaged and get them appreciating the world around them. The afternoon was filled with a series of lectures, workshops, and facilitated discussions, including one from brand new Northeast Region Refuge Chief Scott Kahn and longtime Mountain Prairie Region Chief Rick Coleman. You know, it's funny when we get together and we're talking about this vision document, we start off with what are all the challenges that we want to address in the refuge system and, and, and from Region 5 we have all of those challenges there. Um, but what struck me about the vision document here in our process is that our people are passionate and there are no uh, shortages of uh, folks who want to step up and be creative and think innovatively to find real world solutions to these problems. And, um, you know, you look at these recommendations and as we move forward to implementation and actually putting these things to work on the ground, I couldn't be more excited about where I think we're going. And in the Northeast region specifically, um, lots of the challenges that we face are associated with people, right, with habitat loss and, and the rest of it. But the opportunities are people-based too. Um, you know, we have great opportunities in Region 5 to engage people in the solutions. We have lots and lots of people who want to help us be successful. So I'm really looking forward to it. I see lots and lots of opportunities in Region 5 to implement this vision. It's really important that we do this vision process and meet in the different rooms and share ideas. And in doing so, we're coming together with a common understanding of what we want to do, what we want to accomplish. What are our objectives of the refuge system? What can we tell Congress and the taxpayer who are demanding that now, what we will deliver for the refuge system as we move forward? Having this common vision, a common understanding in a document called the Vision for the Next Century, we all will work together, pull together, share common ideas, share elements of success, so that we can replicate that across the refuge system. Together, we'll raise the level of expectation and we'll raise our accomplishments for the refuge system. A unique service asset made a visit to Madison. Courtney White made a visit to the parking lot today to the Wetland on Wheels. We've been partnering with the uh, Silvio Orconti National Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to help operate the watershed on wheels. We try to bring the message of conservation and environmental education in the best way possible with interactives, with a walkthrough, where you get a full experience, an immersion of the Silvio Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we have models of almost 40 different animals. We have sound, we have smells, we have uh, different habitats so the kids can really start to immerse themselves get an experience that they might not have otherwise. We've had wonderful success in basically every community we visited from Norwalk, Connecticut up through the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont. 
Silvio Conti is really important, really driven by the amount of partnerships that we have. We're here today with Vins, which is a really good partner, and they actually help staff and maintain this facility, this uh, watershed on wheels, the WOW exhibit. The cool part about this watershed on wheels that we have here is it now gives us the possibility to be able to reach everyone in, within those communities. We can drive this. I mean, as you can see, we're in Wisconsin today. I mean, we can take it anywhere in the, in the United States. Uh, and you get to see people along the way as you travel, but then also, uh, obviously, the destination, uh, you can really kind of uh, function as a magnet for the community that way too. It's something that's new, it's fresh, they haven't seen that before, and it's a great way to get the service known throughout the country. The conference motto is conserving the future. Linking the past with that future, service historian Mark Madison discusses the role of history at the conference. Hi, I'm Mark Madison. I'm the Fish and Wildlife Services Historian at the National Conservation Training Center. I'm here with the Heritage of the Refuge System because I think it's important uh, that we look back to the folks that came before us, like Paul Craigle, Olas Murray, Rachel Carson, Elder Leopold, uh, if we're going to look forward and come up with a new vision for the service. There was a youthful flair at the conference this week as youth delegates from the Fish and Wildlife Service partnered with Operation Fresh Start crew members in a community service project at Olin Park. Laura Bono has more. My name is Mao Lin and for the Conserving the Future conference I'm the lead for the Youth Engagement Workgroup and today we have a partnership with Operation Fresh Start. We have uh, about 18 youth with us at the conference who will be helping out with various projects, but also they'll be exposed to the Fish and Wildlife Service and hopefully get an opportunity to network with, uh, with all sorts of Fish and Wildlife Service employees. So today with our partnership with Operation Fresh Start, we're out at Olin Park and um, Operation Fresh Start youth, plus our youth, are, are helping the city of Madison remove invasive species from Olin Park. Uh, and the reason that we think that this work is really important is um, as, uh, as the conference just begins here in Madison, uh, we really want to connect the conference attendees to sort of like local work in Madison um, and sort of give back, uh, especially give back to an organization in Madison which is already doing such great work uh, on the ground here. It's great because we're, for me at least, uh, I'm getting a different experience working with invasion species in a different part of the country, um, but in general it's just good work. Throughout the conference, attendees flooded the social media airwaves through the live stream and stopping by the news desk to express their views on the day's events. I'm having a great time here in Madison at the Vision Conference and I'm really excited about the energy from all of the conference sessions, but I just got out of the Citizen Science Workshop and the presenters really did a nice job of involving the group and I learned a lot from other projects that are going on. by Rick Coleman's words regarding what's needed for refuges in the future, thinking critically and outside the box and not being sucked into the daily routines. I really enjoyed that. I just got out of the workshop on fire and urban landscapes. It was very interesting, lots of examples of what really goes into planning a good controlled burn. One interesting thing that's being done is using goats to reduce fuel loads. I uh, didn't quite expect to get that out of an urban landscape fire workshop, but there you are, goats. For America's Wild Report, I'm Jennifer Strickland.